Hello and welcome to the UGC EPG Pachala. We are looking at the course Introduction to Linguistics and this is the third module of that course. This is called The Design Features of Language. My name is Amrita Valli. I am a professor at the English and Foreign Languages University in Hyderabad. What do we mean by the design features of language? Well, we are familiar by now perhaps with the idea of universal grammar. The idea that there is a biologically specified innate ability unique to the human species which allows us to have language. And therefore, that all languages, all human languages, past, present and future have certain features that make them learnable by the human infant. These are given by the biology of the species. And this is what we call the design features of language. Today, let's begin by considering four of these design features of language. The first is hierarchical structure. The second is recursion. The third is discontinuous dependencies and the fourth is called discrete infinity. We'll look at each of these in turn. The ideas are quite interesting and not too difficult. What do we mean by hierarchical structure? The words in a sentence look to us as if one follows the other as if they are like beads on a string. When we speak a sentence, we speak one word after another. When we write a sentence, we write one word after another. But when we look at sentences carefully, we realize that the words in a sentence are grouped together in hierarchical phrases. And unless we have this knowledge about language, we cannot explain certain properties of language. For example, let's begin with a very simple rule of English, which almost everybody who knows some English knows. This is the rule which makes yes-no questions from statements or declarative sentences. So take a sentence like, the man is tall. The man is tall. How do you make a, a question out of this sentence? A yes-no question. What I call a yes-no question is a question which asks, uh, which asks for an answer which is either yes or no. Such a question in English would be, is the man tall? What have we done? We've taken the verb is in, this, in the statement or the declarative sentence it is the third word in the sentence, the man is tall. We've taken it and put it to the front of the sentence. Now, it's a very simple rule, but how do we describe it? We can't always say, take the third word of the sentence to the front of the sentence, because we could have a sentence like, he is tall, in which case, is he tall, is the question, and is, is the second word. We need to have at least a reference to the fact that this is the verb of the sentence. Let's call it the auxiliary verb of the sentence. So suppose we say, move the first auxiliary verb is to the front of the sentence. Now look at another sentence and see what happens if you write a rule like this, which simply says, move the first verb is to the front of the sentence. The sentence I'm now giving you is, the man who is in the room is tall. How many instances of the verb is are there in that sentence? The man who is in the room is in who is in the room is tall. So there are two verbs is. And if you move the first verb is, you get a wrong sentence. You can go on putting more and more clauses into this sentence, making it larger and larger. So, for example, on the screen now, you can see a sentence. The man who is in the room that is my office is tall. 
I have an office room. There's a man in that room and he is tall. The man who is in the room, that is my office, is tall. Then if I want to ask you, you're saying there's somebody in my office. Is the man who is in the room that is, in, that is my office tall? Is he tall? Now which is did I move? Again, I moved the is which is immediately before the adjective tall. You see, the point I'm making is the man is tall. Is tall is the predicate of the sentence. The man is the subject of the sentence. Now, the subject and the predicate can be separated by intervening sentences, it appears, because the man who is in the room is tall. Who is in the room? The man is in the room. So that's a, some kind of a sentence there. That relative clause, you can think of it as a sentence. But that sentence does not count for moving the word is to the front of the sentence. The man who is in the room is tall. You do not move the first is. You move the is which is followed by the verb, uh, by the adjective tall. So similarly, the man who is in the room that is my office is tall. Again, it is the is tall. The is of is tall that you move. This shows that somewhere in your mind, you're putting everything before is tall into the subject of the sentence and letting it go further down into the tree structure of the clause. If you had a kind of machine for which you gave a very simple rule, move is to the front of the sentence. And the machine said, which is do you want me to move? And you told it, the first is, you get the wrong results. You couldn't tell it which is to move in terms of first, second, third, fourth, or fifth at all, because you can go on adding man who is tall, who is in my office, who is late for work every day, who, I, who is eating pan. You can go on adding things. And still, you can't move any of those words is to the front of the sentence, you have to come to is tall to move it. How do you tell a machine that? You tell it by saying language has hierarchic structure and the verb of this main clause is the verb that has to move. So that is a design property of language that although when you look at it uh, in, a, in, a, in a naive kind of way, a sentence seems to be just words put together. But when we look more closely, we realize that those words are structured into hierarchical units. So that's the first design feature of language. Now, these same sentences that we've already considered show us the second property, which is a design property of language. And that is the property of recursion. Recursion is when something happens again and again and again. We have seen that we can put a sentence into the subject noun phrase. The man is tall. The subject is the man. The man who is in the room is tall. Who is in the room is a kind of short, shorthand for the man is in the room. The man is in the room. That man is tall. Now you put that first sentence into the noun phrase, the man who is in the room. So you have expanded the noun phrase of the subject by putting a sentence into it. And you can go on doing this indefinitely, which is what we did. The man who is in the room that is my office is tall. The man is in the room, the room is my office, and that man is tall. Three sentences put together, two sentences put together into the subject noun phrase. So this property of putting one thing inside another, the property of recursion, shows us that sentences can go on indefinitely. They can be infinitely long. There is no way that we can say that this is the longest sentence that can be said or written. Let's take recursion, more examples, simpler examples perhaps. Let's take an example of recursion in the noun phrase. Start with a very simple word, which everybody knows. Let's start with the word color. We'll call it a noun phrase. So I ask you, the color of what? And you say, suppose you say, the tail's color. 
something has a tail. So you're talking about the color, the tail's color. So I ask you, the tail of what? And you can say, the cat's tail's color. You see now, you're putting, first you put a possessor, and you, then you, uh, you had the word color, you put a possessor on it, tail's color. Then you took another possessor, who possesses the tail, the cat's tail's color. You can go on. Whose cat is it? A niece's cat. So you're talking about a niece's cat's tail's color and so on. You can go on indefinitely. Chuhe ka, something ka, something ka, something ka, something. In Hindi, you can do that. You can have fun doing it in your own languages. You can put sentences inside sentences. Let's take a sentence like, the earth moves. Do you remember who said that first? Galileo. Galileo said that the earth moves. So you've put the earth moves into another sentence. Galileo said. Galileo said that the earth moves. Now were you there to see him say this? No, but somebody has claimed it. The officers claimed that Galileo said that the earth moves. So you've put one sentence into another sentence into another sentence. The officers claimed that Galileo said that the earth moves. Which officers were they? They were perhaps officers of the church. And the church was, as you remember from history, quite upset. So the church alleged that the officers said, or the officers claimed, that Galileo said that the earth moves. How many sentences do you have there? The church alleges something. It alleges that the officers have claimed something. The officers have claimed that Galileo has said something. And Galileo has said that the earth moves. So you've got four sentences in there. And then the, you can go on adding to it, depending on your patience and your ingenuity, if you want to make sensible sentences. If you don't need to make sensible sentences, you can simply go on. The people said that the officer said that the church said that the uh, children said and so on. But I've tried to make sensible sentences for you. So the people reported that the church alleged that the officers claimed that Galileo said that the earth moves. This is a perfectly normal sentence of English. And you can see that one sentence has many sentences in it. And in theory, you can go on like this forever. It's just that we, don't, we have neither the patience nor enough things to say in one sentence. Now, a third design feature of language is that it has discontinuous dependencies. When Chomsky first started talking about what language really is like, he gave the example of discontinuous dependencies. Take a clause which has the structure, if some sentence happens, then another sentence happens. If the bus comes, then we can go. Now, you can easily see that the word then is linked to the word if. If and then are like the antecedent and the consequent of a conditional. So unless you have if, the then here does not make any sense. If the bus comes, then we can go. So there is a dependency between if and then, which is separated by the conditional sentences. Now these conditional sentences, the antecedent to the conditional and the consequent to the conditional, can be as long as they like because of the property of recursion. Because remember, we can put a sentence in a sentence in a sentence in a sentence. So we can make a sentence like, if you think that the bus comes here, then something, something, I leave it to your imagination. I can make the antecedent longer. I can say, if I believe that you think that the bus comes here, then. What is happening? The distance between if and then is growing. And yet, we know that if and then are dependent. So you can put in an arbitrarily long sentence, theoretically infinite in length, between if and then. This is a design property of language. Another 
set of words in English which behaves like this is either and or. Again, either the bus comes or we can't go. Either you think that the bus comes here or such and such and such thing. So these are discontinuous dependencies. Now you might be wondering, what about our own languages? Do they have discontinuous dependencies? Yes, they do because our languages have a lot of what we call subject verb agreement, right? So if you have a singular subject, the verb has to be in a certain form. If you have a plural subject, the verb has to be in a slightly different form. In our languages, sometimes depending on whether the subject is masculine or feminine, uh, it is in a different form and so on. English has a very limited amount of this kind of agreement. So I'm taking the example from English for the purposes of teaching. But this example really speaks to our languages. Again, we can show that the agreement between a subject and a verb is a discontinuous dependency and that it can be separated by an arbitrarily long string of words. Take a look at these two sentences. The man is here. The men are here. What do, you, what, do I, what do I mean by subject verb agreement? If the man is the subject, it's singular and the verb has to be is. If the subject is the men, it is plural and the verb has to be are. Very simple rule of English and as I said English has very little subject verb agreement but in your language and mine there is a lot of that. For example in Hindi, admi aya and well, admi has no morphological plural, admi aye. Uh, let's take uh, something, uh, ladka aya, ladke aye, ladki aye. Okay, that's subject verb agreement. Now, look at what happens in English or in your language. You can do it in your language also. You can expand the subject by putting in relative clauses in it, as we have done earlier. So, the man who criticized the government is here, not are here. So, what is that is referring back to? The man. Although in the middle, there are so many words there. Who criticized the government? Now, the verb doesn't have to look at all that. It just has to look at the man and say, I'm going to be is, I'm not going to be are. Okay. So, similarly, you can put in more things there. The man who criticized the governments that imprisoned him without a trial is here because still there's only one man who's here. Although in between we have got governments which are plural, right? Let me read that sentence again. The man who criticized the governments that imprisoned him without a trial is here. The is will refer to the man, it will not refer to the governments. Again, the man who I believe criticized the governments that imprisoned him without a trial is here. So there's this continual dependency between the man and is and that is a discontinuous dependency because it can be separated by many other intervening relative clauses. And then we come to the property of language called discrete infinity. Infinity, that property you are now already familiar with because we have said, because we can put a sentence in a sentence in a sentence, like Chinese boxes. Have you seen Chinese boxes? You put a box in a box in a box in a box. There's also these Russian dolls, you know, you get a doll within a doll within a doll within a doll. Notice that I'm using recursive prepositional phrases. A doll within a doll within a doll within a doll. Okay. So we are familiar with that property of recursion. The minute you allow recursion, you have allowed a system that can generate an infinite sentence because you cannot tell the system at what point it should stop. The system, if you have the patience, it can go on forever. You have neither the need nor the patience to speak a sentence that goes on forever. But the system allows you to do that. Therefore, language has the property of infinity. This is easy to understand. What do we mean by discrete infinity? Uh, lately, Chomsky has been using this phrase for language. Now, the way I understand 
discrete infinity is by anal analogizing language to the number system. Uh, you probably remember from your school days that a line can be infinitely long. Do you remember this? I think you were taught this in geometry that you can draw a line which is 2 inches or 3 centimeters long. But in theory, a line can go on forever. It can be infinitely long. However, that kind of infinity, you cannot identify discrete subparts of a line. A line does not have subparts that you can identify within it. It does not have separable parts. On the other hand, take the number system. It's very easy to see that the number system also generates an infinity. It is an infinitely long system. It can go on forever because take any arbitrary number. I, I, I usually don't count beyond 1000 and 10,000, but let's take 10,951 and the next person can add one to it and make it 10,952. But you can go on and on, millions, billions, trillions, if you're an astronomer, you cope with these astronomical numbers. And however astronomical your number, you can add one to it and make it go on. Unlike the example of the line, which is infinitely long, numbers consist of discrete, identifiable parts. If you're using the decimal system, you use the numbers 1 to 9 and you use them to compose them in such a way that the numbers can go on forever. So that is what I understand by discrete infinity, that the number system has recognizable individual numbers. It has rules for composing these numbers. For example, in the decimal system, you go from 1 to 9 and then at 10, you use the place value to shift 1 to the 10th place and put a 0 in the units place. And then you start again, 11, 12, 13, 14 and so on. So there are rules of composition and there is a basic vocabulary of numbers 0 to 9. And using these two, you can go on forever generating numbers bigger and bigger and bigger. Similarly, language uses words and morphemes which are individually recognizable and isolatable. They are discrete. Discrete means separable. And there are rules for putting together these words and morphemes into sentences in such a way that the sentences can go on forever. And that is why we say language has the property of discrete infinity. And children seem to enjoy this property because at least in English, I know that a very popular nursery rhyme goes, this is the cat that ate the rat that bit the cheese that back Jack bought. There's also the house that Jack built, I think. There are all these kinds of children's uh, language games which use sentences within sentences. And children have lots of fun playing them and trying to remember what, how many sentences should go into those sentences. And I'm sure there are games like that in our languages as well. So, so far we've talked about design features of language like we began with hierarchical structure, we talked about recursion, then we talked about discontinuous dependencies, remember if then either or subject verb agreement and so on. And then we said that nowadays these properties are talked about under the label of discrete infinity. A fifth design feature of language is that of displacement. Now, what I mean by displacement is that a word can appear in a sentence in one place, but be interpreted in another place in that sentence. To understand this, let's look at this sentence and two variants of this sentence. The sentence is Bill killed John. A three word sentence, very simple sentence. Bill killed John. You can passivize this sentence and say John was killed. 
and you can ask a question whom did Bill kill? The point I'm making is that there is displacement in the second and third examples. Now in the first example Bill killed John there is a subject which is Bill and there is an object which is John. In the passive John was killed what do you find? The subject of the sentence has become John. We know that it's, it is the subject because it agrees. It, it triggers agreement with the verb. If it is singular, you say John was killed. If it is plural, you say the men were killed. So we know that it is the subject of the sentence. It is the grammatical subject of the sentence. But then you ask, where is the object of kill? And then you realize that John is the object of kill in the passive. John was killed. The person who got killed was John. Bill killed John. The person who got killed was again John. In the first sentence, John is in the object position. In the passive sentence, John has come to the subject position. But he is interpreted as if he is the object of kill. And that is what we mean by displacement. The word John appears in the subject position but we know that he is the person who undergoes the killing and not the person who does the killing. Okay? Similarly, take the question, whom did Bill kill? Again, the same reasoning applies. Because kill is a verb which needs an object. Bill kill in itself is not a sentence of English. Because if I asked you, if I said to you, Bill kill, you will ask, Bill kill what? Bill kill who? Kill needs an object. But when I say, whom did Bill kill? You understand that it is a question. You understand that I don't know who Bill killed. It's a question about the identity of the object of kill. What underwent the killing? So again, although the word whom appears in the beginning of the sentence, even before the subject, it has to be interpreted as the object of the verb kill. So it has been displaced from its interpretable position in the sentence. It has moved. We have interesting evidence that it has moved, but it still mentally occupies the original position. And that is this. Suppose I say, whom did Bill kill Mary? You feel that there are too many people in that sentence. Either Bill killed Mary or you don't know who Bill killed and you ask whom did Bill kill. Uh, in current colloquial English you simply say who did Bill kill. I've put in that whom because some of you might feel that it should be the object and so it should have whom there. But nowadays in spoken English English is losing all its cases, so we simply say, who did Bill kill? So let's say it that way. Who did Bill kill? If I say, who did Bill kill? I cannot put an object of kill now. Who did Bill kill Mary becomes ungrammatical. So it behaves, the sentence behaves as if that object is still sitting there and nothing else can sit in its place. I always say it's like an imaginary king, you know, when the king is absent from the court also, uh, traditionally, nobody else will sit in the king's chair and the chair represents the king in some sense. So similarly, you can move home out of the object's position, but it is mentally still present in the object's position. And this is what we call displacement. Um, in English, when you ask a question, you don't leave the question word in its place. So in English, you can say, Bill killed who? But you have to say it in that funny way. Bill killed who? Which means you didn't hear properly. It's called an echo question, which says that you're not very sure what you heard. Uh, it, it isn't a question which is asking for information. Whom did Bill kill? Who did Bill kill? Okay. In our languages, apparently, you can leave the question word in its place. 
but there is some evidence that even in our languages there is some particular place that the question word moves to and that it moves next to the verb but that is going into great syntactic detail so I won't go into that in this lesson. Now you might again think that our languages don't have many of the rules that we've been talking about in English because our languages mark case on the subject and the object and all those arguments of the verb and then you it, it appears that you can allow the words to go anywhere in the sentence any which way sometimes our languages are referred, are referred to as free word order languages there's a large literature and a large debate about free word order what we now believe is that it is not all free the word order there is something like a default word order and that default word order you can look at the Hindi example I've given you is subject indirect object object and verb so you can say in Hindi something like Noor ne Anjumko Kitab di and very uh, in many of other uh, our Dravidian languages also this is the default word order that is, if you just say a sentence out of the blue, as we say, without any context, this is the word order in which you speak the sentence. The subject comes first, followed by the indirect object, followed by the direct object, followed by the verb. You can say this sentence with many other word orders, but you find, when you look at it carefully, that these word orders always assume some kind of uh, what we call discourse context so anjumko noorne kitabdi when would you say that sentence okay to anjum noor gave a book perhaps you could say that when anjum is somebody that you know who is already in the topic of discourse and you don't know what was given to anjum and then you say kitabdi noorne kitab anjum ko di now it feels like who did Noor give the book to and it was to Anjum that Noor gave the book. Anjum ko kitab Noor ne di. It feels like you're asking who gave the book to Anjum. Kitab Anjum ko Noor ne di. For more on, the, on these kinds of word orders and the effects that they have, please look at the e-lesson on this topic. Uh, this topic of scrambling has been discussed by Ayesha Kidwai and we ha I have referred to that in the e-lesson as well. It's very difficult to simply talk about it in a program like this. So I think it's better we go and read it. Hmm? Again, I can give you one more example that our languages are not really free word order languages. This was noticed by Jai Shilan for Malayalam and I'm giving you the corresponding Kannada example. Take a sentence in Kannada like Nanu and the Gidakya Neer Hakde, which means I to a plant water gave, which means I gave water to a plant. Hmm? Again, notice it's the same default word order I to a plant, indirect object, water, direct object, gave, subject, indirect object, direct object, verb. That is the default word order in our languages nanu and the gidakke neer hakte which means i gave water to a plant now you change the word order nanu neeru and the gidakke hakte nanu neeru and the gidakke hakte i have interchanged the positions of the direct object and the indirect object and the reading one gets is that this is an answer to the question what did, you do, what did you do with the water? What did you do with the water? So the water becomes definite. Okay, It doesn't mean I gave water to a plant. It means as for the water, I gave it to a plant. All right. So word order is not completely free even in our languages. Finally, there is a property of language which was noticed much earlier than in Chomsky and linguistics. And this is called the arbitrariness of the linguistic sign. And 
This is part of the work of Ferdinand de Saussure. We talk about the word as the Saussurean sign. What does this mean, the arbitrariness of the linguistic sign? What Saussure pointed out was that it is a fact of language, of all languages in the world, that the sound by which we call something has no intrinsic connection with the thing itself. It's completely arbitrary, what we call something. So I've given you examples. So the word dog in English refers to what you recognize as a dog. But in French, the same object is called chien. Excuse my pronunciation. Uh, in German, it's called hund. In Hindi, it is called kutta. In uh, Kannada and Tamil, it is called nai. And in Malayalam, it is called patti. Now, the interesting thing is, even what we call onomatopoeic words, that is, words which seem to mimic the sound of whatever they refer to, even those are colored by the language in which they occur. Just ask yourself, in English, the, the cock is supposed to say cock -a doodle doo in uh, Hindi, it is supposed to say kukurun ku. I don't know what it says in Tamil. Uh, how does the dog bark in your language? In Kannada, it says lol lol. It does not say bow wow or wow wow. Okay? So you can ask yourselves, how does the sound of the rain sound in your language? Okay? Things like this. You can have great fun looking at what they call onomatopoeic words, and you'll find that even those are not exact imitations of the sound itself, but some kind of filtering or coloring through the sound system of your language, they are linguistic signs. So with that, we come to the end of this unit. And what we have tried to look here, look at here are the design features of language. What we mean by design features are features that are universally found in all languages, features that can be attributed to UG or universal grammar. And we have said that these features are that language has hierarchical structure, that language allows for recursion, that language has discontinuous dependencies between its elements, language has the property of discrete infinity, and language has the property of displacement. That is, words may appear in one place, but be interpreted at another place. Thank you.